Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Rougarou Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Polina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 433 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as ever, by former heavyweight world title challenger, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how you doing this week, my man? I'm doing great, my man. How about you? Yeah, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm always good when speaking with you. You always say you're doing great. Are we ever going to hear you say, no, actually, I'm having not not such a great week? I mean... There, for me, every day that you wake up and, you know, every day I'm able to do some of the things that I love to do and see the people I love to see, talk to the people I love to talk to like you, Joe. I can't be mad. I mean, don't get me wrong. From time to time, everybody has struggles. But the reality of it is, man, you got to keep moving forward. So, you know, as much as I would like to sometimes sulk and cry and complain, I just can't. <laughs> so... You know, I got too many good things going for me right now, so I'm just going to be satisfied about that. Good to hear, man. Good to hear. Um, Yeah, you say keep moving forward very much unlike your boxing style. I'm joking. (laughs) That is not true at all, Joe. You know how I walk down the big dudes, man. No, no, no. All right, man. Let's dive straight into the review part. We're going to start here. At the York Hall in Bethnal Green, London, United Kingdom. Um, One fight to mention. Friend of the show, Casey Kadami, with a loss, unfortunately. Uh, Unanimous decision over 12 rounds there for the vacant IBO flyweight world title. Kadami down in the first round. He's now 10-2 and two with two draws. A unanimous decision in favor of the South African Jackson Chowke, who's now 24-2 and two with two draws. Um... I only caught the last few rounds of the fight, you know. Um, I didn't realize that it started as early as it had started. Um, I think, yeah, it was on YouTube as well, so I tuned in. Um, yeah, you know, this this guy, Jackson Chowke, I didn't know too much about him going in. Um, from what I could kind of read from the fight, it seemed like Kadami was, was, was old-manned a little bit. Um, I didn't realize as well that this guy was was uh, you know quite experienced as an amateur. Um, I believe he's he's some kind of boxing coach. Um, but yeah, the bits I did see, like I say, Kadami just wasn't judging the distance properly. He was falling short and getting countered. He was also smothering his own work when he was up close. Um, wide in the end on the scorecards, regardless of the local support for Kadami. I think there's a bit of a blueprint now for Kadami. I hate to say that, but I really feel like he struggles with pressure fighters and he lacks the power to deter them. Um, having said that, he was coming off two back-to-back stoppages, but I don't think he's got, like, you know, fantastic power or whatever. It does need to be mentioned, though, that this fight, obviously, like we say, was down at flyweight and... Kadami was a little bit depleted from what I've been told. Um, I think he's going to move back up to Superfly. Um, I think there's a you know decent fight uh, in the pipeline for him there. Um, but yeah, you know it, it was a very bad look. It's a bad look losing to this guy. You know, 38 years of age. You know, and like I say, hadn't really beaten anyone that great. But you know, it's a bad look for Kadami. But all the best to him. Like I say, he's a nice guy, a friend of the show. New trainer, old trainer, both guys, friends of the show. Uh, That's it, though, for York Hall. All the best to him. Moving now to the Ulster Hall, which I couldn't believe how much it looked like York Hall. Like, come on, man. It's, it's, It's a copy. It's a copy. It's a copy of York Hall. Ulster Hall looks exactly the same. Um... 
in Belfast, Northern Ireland. It was live on DAZN, match room, of course. Let's start with the undercard. Good win for Connor Walker. Um, it took him only three rounds to get the TKO against the previously undefeated 9-0 Lloyd Germain. Now 9-1, Connor Walker, like I say, now 13-2 and two with a draw. Jermaine down three times in that torrid third round. Also on the card, Paddy Donovan with a TKO win. Um, he is now 13-0. and 0. Uh, The TKO came in round seven against Williams Herrera, who'd never been stopped. He's now 15-3, and three, but that's the first time, like I say, he's been stopped. Um, it was a fun fight. It was a learning fight for Paddy. Um, he was in against, you know, an Argentinian fighter, like I say, who'd only lost just twice. Both times he'd lost, it was to undefeated fighters as well. That should be mentioned. And yeah, Donovan, like I said, becomes the first man to stop him. And the Argentine was pretty good, to be honest. You could see that. And he did seem to hurt Donovan to the body a little bit. Just a little bit. Made me think maybe... You know, body shots could be the weakness of Donovan. We'll have to wait and see for the future. But it was a good fight. It was a fun fight. And I think, you know, we probably didn't see the very best of Donovan there. He should come back, you know, and learn from that next time. Also on the clock, very... On the clock, I said there. I think you probably know who I'm going to talk about. Also on the card, Siobhan Clark. Now... 8-0, a TKO for him in round four against Tommy McCarthy, now 20-6 and for the vacant WBA Intercontinental Cruiserweight title. McCarthy down once in round four. Um, really good win for Chev Clark. I mean, I said we'd see rounds here, and Chev must have heard me say it and did his best to prove me wrong. He pretty much steamrolled McCarthy, and he came out punching with bad intentions pretty much from the first bell. I was really impressed with Clark, and I'm not... I'm not Clark's biggest fan. I haven't seen enough to make me think he's going to go on to, you know, like world honours and stuff like that. But in comparison with how others have dealt with McCarthy, that was highly impressive. He's done it in just four rounds. That's the same round as Richard Reakpour, but quicker than, than the likes of Michael Sislak and Chris Billum smith um, So, yeah, I did say he'd be a bit, a bit too fresh, I think, for McCarthy, and that was the case. But I didn't think he'd get to him that that early on I did think we we could see it go to distance but we'd certainly see it go late but that is a really good win there for Clark uh, all the best to him and then yeah the main event Lewis Crocker now 19 and 0 a TKO for him in round 5 against Jose Felix now 40 and 7 with a draw it was for the vacant WBO Intercontinental welterweight title Felix had a point took off in round 3 for a low blow he was down once in the fourth round once in the fifth round um yeah, really, really good performance, I felt, from uh, Lewis Crocker. You know, a lot of people were, were kind of, I don't know, criticising the win, saying, well, you know, he was much bigger, he was a much bigger man. Um, but yeah, what about the fact that Gary Cully was the, Mitch, the, the much bigger man against Felix and obviously got sparked out there in a shock loss? You know, he, he didn't seem to struggle with the size that night, you know, Felix, so... I didn't, you know, I don't think he was too bothered really about the size here or, he, you know, certainly not going into the fight. But, yeah, Crocker was brilliant, I felt. You know, he took some good shots. He, he showed a good chin. He's a very confident fighter. I think he believes in his power, which is a good asset. Um, he hurt the Mexican to the body in the fourth round, had him down, like I say. He's down again in the fifth. Um, the stoppage might have been a tad premature, but all in all, a really good performance. And I think Ireland slash Northern Ireland should be, re you know, very proud of this guy. I think he's got a bright future for sure. I'm quite a big Lewis Crocker fan. I really thought he was brilliant against Tyrone McKenna. And like I say, I think he was really good here again. Uh, that's it, though, for the Ulster Hall. Moving now to the final card to mention. It went down at the Footprint Center in Phoenix, Arizona, USA. It was live on DAZN again. So we had an early and a late card. I think DAZN were showing boxing in the UK from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., so a nice 12 hours. Um, let's talk about the undercard. Darius Folgum, or Folgum, I think they might be calling him, he was able to win a majority decision against friend of the show, Alontez Fox, now 28-6 and six with a draw. Alontez obviously lost here. Uh, majority decision, like I say, over 10 rounds. So Fox becomes the first man to take Folgum the distance. He'd knocked everyone out. He was 9-0 and with 9 KOs. Fox wasn't down or anything like that during the fight. It was for the WBA Intercontinental Super Middleweight title. Um, yeah, you know, look. 
it was always going to be a tough ask for Alontes. Uh, he's a friend of the show. I think I said on last week's last week's podcast. You know, we'd spoke. Um, you know, I, I said to him, "You can't really afford to to be getting stopped again." You know what I mean? You've been stopped three times in five losses. He'd been stopped in two of his previous three fights going in, and he's fighting another big puncher. You can't really afford to get stopped, and he didn't get stopped. I know that we can't celebrate too much in the fact that you just didn't get stopped. You know, it's not like that's a great achievement. You still lost the fight. It's about winning and losing, not not getting knocked out. But um, I liked what I saw in parts of that fight from him. I think that Fox needs to kind of work on the right hand a little bit. Um, but he, he, he showed a... You know, really good chin. Um, he had to hold at times when he started to tire late on. I thought his left hook was brilliant. Um, but yeah, impressed with Folgum as well, or Folgum, however you say his name, for goodness sake. But yeah, good fighter, and I'd like to see him again. Obviously a good gas tank, which you never quite know with a puncher if they've got, you know, the gas. Can they go all those rounds? Well, he, he's gone 10 there without a problem. He still looked quite fresh late on. Um, I don't think the fight should have been a majority decision. I think, it, you know, even though I'd like to be biased to Fox, I think it was clear that he lost that fight quite wide. Um, moving to this fight that took place on the card as well. Gabriella Fandora, she's now 13-0. and 0, A TKO for her in the 10th and final round. A successful defense of her IBF flyweight world title. She was 2-1 to one to get the to get the KO, um, like I say, 13-0, and 0. a TKO against Christina Cruz, the 41-year-old, really good amateur, now 6-1, and 1. Um, very controversial stuff though, I have to say, I mean, Cruz started the fight really well, um, she was winning pretty much all the early rounds, Fundora was in a bit of a pickle throughout the first few rounds, um, but then Fundora did start to come on strong, like I say, later on in the fight. I think the 41-year-old Cruz did start to tire. Um, it's unquestionable that Fundora was taking over, but I wasn't strictly scoring it, and I wasn't strictly watching it all that much. I wasn't, you know, I couldn't tell you too much about the scores and stuff, but I know that Cruz was up, like I say, to the middle part of the fight, Cruz, I think, was up, and then... Like I say, uh, a horrendous stoppage in the 10th and final round. Cruz turned her back because she ended up with her back to Fundora. She kind of got spun around. So Cruz turns her back. Um, I think she tripped a tiny bit. And she had a, you know, her, her guard up kind of thing, like behind her head, so that she didn't get hit in the back of her head. Then the referee just jumps in and stops it. It was such a bad stoppage. It really was um, horrible, horrible, especially in a world title fight. I mean... It should be appealed. I, I I I wasn't sure what the cards were at the point of the stoppage. I've now seen them. Fundora was miles ahead, so it wouldn't have actually mattered. But I don't know if that was, you know, if that was right or or what. Because like I say, Cruz picked up a lot of early rounds, but they didn't seem to reflect that in the judges' scorecards. So I'd like to know what our listeners think of that fight. If they've scored it, if anyone scored it, let us know. Let us know if you think that that stoppage pretty much won Fundora the fight. Uh, you know, maybe Cruz may have been ahead at the point of the stoppage on your card. I'd like to know. Um, that's it for that one. Moving to the main event, the final fight to mention. Jaime Mungi are still undefeated, now 43-0, a defense of his WBC silver super middleweight title. A TKO in the ninth round against John Ryder of the UK, friend of the show, now 32-7. Ryder down in round two, round four, and then twice in the ninth round. Um, the first knockdown, I, I, I can't, it was just kind of like a flash knockdown if I'm not mistaken. I think Tony Sim said to Ryder in the corner, like, you know, did he really catch you, or was it just flash? And he said it was flash. It was towards the end of the round. Um, I don't, I, di I didn't really read too much off of it. The second knockdown, I think Ryder was just off balance, and he walked into a light jab. So again, both the knockdowns at that point weren't heavy. They weren't really anything concerning. But unfortunately for Ryder, he was losing the rounds, and losing them 10-8 because of these you know, these soft knockdowns, 
Ryder, though, was hitting Mungia with some unbelievable shots, but obviously he's got an unbelievable chin, and Mungia just kept coming forward again and again. Nothing seemed to deter him. He was outworking Ryder, and even though Ryder was consistently sinking heavy hooks into Mungia's body, he just wasn't even reacting to it. I mean, Mungia was picking his shots well. He wasn't getting over-eager, which is a bit of an improvement. You know, it wasn't like an all-out dogfight, which we've seen Mungia just you know, leave his chin on the line and just punch with you. Um, it wasn't that. It was it was actually quite methodical. Um, I think he took Ryder very seriously. Ryder, as we know, is really, really tough. You know, a real tough guy. Um, you know, you, you'd hate to get a shoulder barge off of John Ryder. You know, he seems to be made of stone. He's a right solid guy. But yeah, round nine, massive round, obviously, for Mungia. Ryder gets caught with a massive shot right in the middle of the forehead. Down he goes. He gets back up. He beats the count. Mungia puts him down again. He beats the count again. And that's when his trainer, Tony Sims, threw the towel in. Brave of John Ryder, like I say, to get in with Mungia after that Canelo fight. I did say I, I, I fancy a stoppage here late on for Mungia. That was 4-1. to one. If you would have been in my boxing betting group, you'd have... Uh, won that bet there because that's something that I staked on four to one for the stoppage in the second half of the fight for Mungia. I did say that I think Ryder's a tough guy. He's going to tough it out as much as he can. But in reality, he's had the Canelo payday. The hunger's probably died down a little bit. And when I said that, I didn't even realize that Ryder had actually said if he lost this fight, he would decide to retire from boxing. I haven't heard anything from him since the loss, but. Um, if he does decide to retire, then what a what a what a great loss for British boxing. Actually, he's a fantastic fighter and fantastic human being. Um, but yeah, like I say, the towel come in. Um, nothing to do with the lack of heart or anything from John Ryder. I, I want to just make that clear. I don't think the lack of hunger came into it at all. Like I say, he put his balls, you know, he hung his balls out to dry, if you like, and. Um, yeah, he did give it his all. He really did. And even when he was hurt, he was, you know, he was firing back. Um, but yeah, Mungia just too good, a little bit too too fresh maybe, um, and just not really the best style, I think, for Ryder. Um, yeah, so if that's going to be the end of the road for Ryder, like I say, I haven't heard anything just yet, but it would be a great shame that he never won a world title. Um I always said, you know, I call him the, the Islington icon or maybe the matchroom battering ram because I just feel like he's been thrown into hard fight after hard fight after hard fight. And I, I don't know much about his finances, but I hope he's made a lot of money and will never need to work again because, um, like I say, he's certainly earned it. But yeah, credit to Mungia. Like I say, he'll be... He'll be um he'll be undersized, but I'd love to see him in with with uh, David Benavidez. There's been a bit of a back and forth there over Instagram, but yeah, they're now back talking about Mungia against Canelo. Um, I just want to see Mungia, you know, continue to be in big fights. This was a good, you know, a good big fight, but there's a lot of really good fighters at super middleweight, and he needs to get back to the very top of the tree and become world champion again, or at least fight some of the top dogs, because there's no shortage of them at super middle. But anyway, that brings the review part to a close. I didn't even need to come to Eddie in this part. But anyway, it's now time to welcome this week's special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the hard-hitting super middleweight contender, Derby's finest, it is of course Mr. Zach Parker. Zach, welcome back on the show, my friend. Cheers, mate. Um, nice intro, that was. <laughs> there you go. You deserve it, my That's friend. It. So we last spoke back in September. At the time, you were desperate to get back in the ring following the Ryder fight. Uh, you were set yeah. to take on the very, very tough Khalid Gradia. He'd only been stopped once in 12 losses. You become the second man to stop him. Briefly talk me through that one, Zach. Yeah, it was just get ring rust uh, off him. Obviously, he's a tough guy. He's been in there with some top, top of decision. But yeah, in the end, I think he just took too much too much uh, punishment in the end but yeah it was just get the ring rust off uh, get back out there get back to winning ways and uh, obviously now we're pushing on to uh, bigger fights yeah it should be noted obviously in a, in a row he was over here in the UK box Carol Itauma box Ezra Taylor box Dan Aziz then you the only person to stop him of course was you out of those guys domestically speaking of Khalid Gradia he's back on British soil this weekend he steps in with yeah, Ben Whittaker do you think Ben will yeah, stop yeah, him Zach? Oh, I'll have to wait and see. Obviously, the stars make farts, and um, you see with Ben, he's, 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 a, 
he's a flashy boxer, so it's just if um, he can put the punches together and maybe get a stoppage, but we'll have to wait and see. He's a tough lad, that uh, Khalid Grady is. Yeah, no, absolutely. And just briefly on John Ryder as well, did you happen to see his fight at the weekend? I heard he might retire after losing. I've seen the highlights, yeah. I've seen the highlights of him, obviously, up against a good lad in that Munger. So, yeah, it was a tough fight for him. But, yeah, it's, um, we'll have to see what happens next. I won't mind a rematch for him, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see it. And, um, yeah, your next fight has finally been announced. You'll be boxing former WBA world champion Tyron Zoyga in Birmingham. March the 16th is the date. What do we know about Zoyga, Zach? Yeah, it's, it's been uh, some top lads. Um, he's only lost once to Rocky Fielding, uh, and like you said, he's a former world champion. So yeah, I've got to, I've got to be on my A game in this fight um, and make sure I come out with a win. And then we can push on to maybe top fights uh, within this year. So yeah, it's going it's going to be a tough fight. It's going to come and uh, bring it. He's like a come forward fighter, throws hooks in in bunches as well. So yeah, I've, I've definitely got to be be on be on my A game. And you mentioned there, obviously, he's got the loss to Rocky Fielding. He's one and one against Brits at the moment. He beat Paul Smith. But, yeah, the loss, the only loss of his career come to Rocky Fielding. I thought he was older than 31, to be honest, because it seems like he's been around forever. But back to the actual fight, I think it makes a lot of sense. Obviously, he's a former world champion, Zach, which we touched on. Yeah. But he's only had one bad night in 29 fights. He's by no means done and dusted. No, that's it. He's... He's obviously still got ambition in this game as well. Um, that's why he's coming up against me. Uh, obviously, I think this will probably put yeah, either one of us back in top 10 whoever wins. But yeah, uh, if I'm on my A game uh, on March 16th, I'll, there'll be no doubt of uh, Zach Parker win. And what is the plan, though, Zach? Because obviously, in the past, you were very vocal. You called out some of the big British names like Anthony Yard and a few other guys. This fight here, like I say, makes a lot of sense to someone like me. But is there a plan for after this fight? And I do just want to throw in that five against five thing that they're talking about in Saudi. Surely yeah. you want to be involved in something like that. Yeah, I said that to Neil already. I said, I wouldn't mind being in that, but obviously, one fight at a time, get get a Tyron Zuga out of the way, then that five versus five thing can open up. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm probably one of the top lads in the Queen's briefing, so why not? Um, I, I, did, I did say to Neil, can we get the rider fight? And uh, obviously, I think it'll be a bit easier to get him now uh, after that last fight, because uh, obviously, he's going to just want a couple more paydays now if he is going to stay, stay and fight. But yeah, there's a few names out there in the matchroom um, table. who's obviously... Uh, Billy Joe Saunders, if he's going to come back, that'd be a massive fight. Um, and I think that's what the Saudi Arabians want, want. They want the big names over there. So, yeah, there's quite a few names out there. So, we'll just have to wait and see. Is it a little bit frustrating otherwise to be a super middleweight, Zach, with Canelo pretty much holding up the entire division? Yeah, that's it. We, everyone's just waiting for him to relinquish some belts, but... He's, 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 everyone's going to bow down to him because he's like the cash cow at the minute and he's like one of the biggest names in boxing. So, yeah, uh, I've just got to wait. It's, it's all about patience in boxing. But, yeah, if, um, if no big fights uh, like come open in super middle, I'm always game to move up to like Evie. Uh, but you see with the like Evie's Bibb Bib Tiff and uh, Bibble, they're going to fight each other soon. So they might be all, uh, they might be all locked up as well. Yeah, it's, it's it's crazy, man. Um, yeah. I wanna I wanna get your take. Talking of some light heavyweights, I wanna get your take on this weekend's fight in London. Two undefeated South Londoners, Dan Aziz and Josh Boatsy. How do you see that yeah. one going? Yes, yeah, I think it's gonna be a good fight. To be fair, um, obviously Boatsy been uh, this last few years been been active, been in, in, inactive, and Dan Aziz come on strong, hasn't he? He's won, won British, and then I think he went on one one European. So yeah. I think it's a it's a good pick and fight. Um, it's just who's gonna uh, be good or not and get their get their game plan um, underway. So yeah, um, I think it's like it could be a fifty fifty fight to me. Yeah, it should be a good one for in, sure. In, in, in activity does play a big part in it. You see, with me when, when I boxed Rado, it was, it was like I was out of the ring for like a year, and you, you, no matter how many times you spot, it ain't the same as um, when you're fighting. So yeah, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, should be a good one, like I say. Um, and yeah, also, I know you're a Fury fan, as am I. It's really just yeah. come around so quickly now. It's only a couple of weeks away, Fury Usyk. Yeah. 
uh, the Fury performance against Ngannou has got a few people second guessing. What's your views on it? Yeah, obviously, I think he took Ngannou a bit lightly. Obviously, he's never had a proper boxing match. He's just been in MMA. So, yeah, he probably thought, oh, I probably Bale would beat him easy. But, yeah, that Ngannou, he can, he can obviously, he's a massive guy. He can, in heavyweights, anyone can punch. So, yeah, you've still got to be on your guard. But, but yeah, obviously, the Usyk, Usyk fight's a different, whole different fight, and he? It's a bit smaller. He's a bit more craftier. So, yeah. Uh, but I still see Fury winning it and uh, being undisputed. Let's hope so. It really would be mad. Yeah, uh, yeah. And just, just finally, Zach, before we let you go, if you've got any closing words to the listeners, like I say, you're a friend of the show. It's always great having yeah. you on. Yeah, yeah but, um, cheers for having me on. And obviously, just uh, make sure everyone tunes in to uh, TNT Sport, March 16th. It's going to be a massive um, show to the fair. There's a lot of good fighters on there, likes of Nathan Heaney, um, Liam Davis, Dennis McCann, Obviously myself, so yeah, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a massive fight. So make sure everyone tunes in. Not to mention Joe Joyce as well back on that. Yeah, card. yeah, Joe Joyce. Yeah, another another one. Yeah, it's a ma- it's a massive card to be fair. It's good that we're getting these big cards in the Midlands as well, so I can obviously bring all my fans over. So yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a really good night, and hopefully everyone we get a lot of people over. So yeah, we'll wait and see. Cannot wait for it. Listen, Zach, as always, it's a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you for your time. Best of luck, March sixteenth, and we'll speak sometime afterwards. Thank you, mate. That's well. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part. We're going to start here with a with a fight card that PBC have announced. It's going to be going down on March the 30th. It's going to be live on pay-per-view. It's a, it's a double header. Uh, we're going to see the main event. Keith Furman stepping in the ring with Tim Sue. That was an unexpected fight there to go down at 154. And we're also going to see on the, you know, the chief support WBA super lightweight world champion Rolando Romero defending his belt against Isaac Pitbull Cruz. So that is interesting. Also on the card, we'll see Eris Landy Lara defending his WBA middleweight world title against Michael Zarafa. And Sebastian Fundora steps in with Sergei Bohachuk. That is a fun fight, I think. Um, so it's a, it's a mad card there. Again, the date for that is March the 30th. On pay-per-view, it's going to be on Prime Video. So Amazon Prime pay-per-view. That's going to be interesting to see. Uh, what else do we have? We've got this one announced as well. Top rank here. Uh, Oscar Valdez against Liam Wilson. And Sinisa Estrada steps in with Yocasta Val. That's the undisputed minimum weight showdown there the date for that is march 29th so the two pieces of news there march 29th and march 30th it's going to be a busy end to march this one by the way is at the desert diamond arena um what's up eddie well i get some nice boxing birthday gifts because the 29th is actually my birthday which is great (laughs) there we go thank you boxing people (laughs) for creating a nice boxing birthday for me <laughs> there we go there we go that one to go down on espn plus um so it's, it's going to be a fun fight i think between valdez and wilson and it's great to see sinisa and val getting it on for all the belts at minimum weight um there's a bit of bad blood there as well if i'm not mistaken uh what else do we have vasily lomachenko it's official now he'll be stepping in with george camboso as it goes down in australia in perth May the 12th for that one, which is a Sunday. Um, Again, it's for the IBF lightweight world title. Um, Yeah, it's a fight I think we all knew was coming. There was was a lot of talk about it for quite a while, and it's officially been announced there, so no real surprises. Um, And yeah, that's about it for the news, so let's move on to the preview part. We're going to start here with this card. There's only two cards to mention Uh, We're going to start with this one at the Wembley Arena. Um, Let's touch on the undercard. We're going to see Jamie TKV, or Jimmy TKV, whatever you want to call the guy. He's 5-1. His last fight, he got stopped by that Brazilian, Igor Macedo. And I said on the... the, uh, I don't know if I said it on the podcast or if I put it in the the betting group or whatever, but this guy was 14-1 to to knock out Jimmy TKV, and I backed it. And he knocked out Jimmy TKV, so a lot of people were really happy there. But anyway, 
This guy, Jamie TKV, is back here in his comeback fight, and he gets in with a bit of a dangerous kind of heavyweight journeyman, Konstantin Dovbichenko, who people will know came over here back in July and uh, stopped the undefeated Matty Harris. He also had a very, very close fight last time out with Tom Schwartz in Germany. It went 10 rounds. He lost on points, but a very close fight. He went the distance with Moses Atalma. He was the first person to do that. Um, he was, I believe, the first person to take Jose L Lardu the, the distance as well. Basically, this guy is extremely durable. And um, he won't be getting stopped by TKV. But he... He, you know, there's the price on him isn't even that great. I think he's only about two to one, so they're expecting this to be very competitive, and it should be. Um, but yeah, he could win on points. He could win by stoppage. It's it's a he's a massive live underdog. Um, also on the card, that's over six rounds, by the way, at heavyweight. Also on the card in a six-two six-twos contest, Francesca Hennessy two and zero oh, with one KO. She gets in with Laura Valde Benito, who's five and five with a draw. Um, Argentinian fighter, flyweight. By the way, she's she's naturally a flyweight. She finds herself here up at bantam against Francesca Hennessy. So you'd imagine. I mean, Hennessy seems like you know she she picks her punches well. She's got she's got good power. She obviously stopped the girl on her pro debut, and in in her in her second fight. Um, at times, she was close to getting a stoppage, it looked like. So, I think she's going to be a much bigger girl, much harder punching girl, much fitter girl. And I think that she will probably stop this this girl here. Um, you know, Valda Benito, who has been stopped once in her five losses um, a couple fights ago. She has been to the UK before she boxed Chloe Watson in Newcastle. She lost every round to her over eight uh, that was last time out back in July of last year. Um, so that that could be interesting there. Also on the card, we we spoke about it briefly in the interview part. Ben Whitaker, 5-0 and in an 8-rounder. He gets in with Khalid Gradia, who's 10-13 and with 5 draws. Like I say, only been stopped twice. He's coming off a draw last time out against a guy, though, who was only 1-1. One and one. That's not a good look. All the best to him. He might need it. Also on the card, Caroline Dubois. 8-0 in a 10-rounder here. Her IBO lightweight world title's on the line. She steps in with Miranda Reyes, who's 7-1 with a draw. Never been stopped. Um, I don't know much about this lady, to be totally honest with you. But what I do know is that she beat Yasmin Rivas last time out, even though Rivas has got to be up there in age now. God. Um, so, yeah, that that's a great win. But other than that, you know, she didn't have anything too impressive on her, on her resume. Um, will Caroline stop her? Will Caroline win on points? I'm not too sure, but I'd be very, very confident she'll she'll get the job done. Also, over 12 rounds for the EBU European Super Lightweight title, Adam Azim 10 and 0 steps in with Enoch Paulson, who's 14 and 0. Um, again, this this should be a decent fight. I think I've heard you know that Paulson's a pretty decent fighter. He's more of a boxer, not a puncher. They do share a common opponent in Franck Petitjean, in which Adam Azim, you know, battered him really, um, and in the end managed to get the stoppage after you know a one-sided fight. Uh, well, I say one-sided. He, he did okay in parts of it, but he had a very, very close fight with Enoch Paulson. So. You can read into that what you will. And the main event, Dan Aziz, 20-0. It's for the British and Commonwealth light heavyweight titles. He steps in with Joshua Boazzi, 17-0. It's a battle of, of South London here. Uh, the guys literally live uh, probably 20 minutes away from each other. Um, it, it, it's going to be a good fight. Again, it's one that seems like it's took a long time to come round to see in. I think this is the second or third date that, that was, you know, arranged for this fight, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, yeah, it should be good. Um, I asked Zach Parker again about this one earlier on, and I pretty much agree with everything he said. You know, Boatsy's got that amateur pedigree, and he's the better all-round fighter than Dan Aziz, but there's been a bit of inactivity. Dan Aziz has improved in front of everyone's eyes, he's got better and better and better. There's been fights that I thought were going to be tough for him, and he's come through. 
Um, he has got a lot of momentum. He really does. But yeah, I I think it's going to be interesting. Should be competitive. I would definitely be quite confident that Buatzi should win, though, providing nothing goes too wrong. Um, providing he's you know he's he's not rusty, or providing that he's you know the inactivity hasn't hampered him on his day. I'd say he's a much better fighter than Aziz. So for me. I'm gonna say uh, I'm gonna say Buatzi to win either on points or with a late stoppage. Um, right, that's it for that one. Moving now to the final card. Again, this might be confusing because it goes down at the Cosmopolitan of Las Vegas in Nevada. It's gonna be live on the Zone. However, it's actually gonna be at prime time UK time. So this show will clash with the. Uh, the, the Aziz and Boatsy card, unfortunately. So that's a bit of a pickle for UK, uh, for U- well, for everyone really that's watching this because obviously it's at the same time all around the world. But um, yeah, they're doing it so that the main event takes place at 2 p.m. Vegas time, which will be 10 p.m. Uh, UK time, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, let's run through the undercard. We're going to start with the Romford Ball, Johnny Fisher. Seems like his dad has been welcomed to Las Vegas with with open arms. Um, this is an interesting one, actually, because he's 10-0, 9 KOs. He steps in with Dimitro Bezus, who some people may remember. He's 10-1. He got stopped in his one loss to... Um, David Adelaide in a fight that I was at at York Hall. And if I'm not mistaken, it was a bit of a quick stoppage. He was complaining. Um, He was down in the first round, but yeah, he was complaining. And um, there was an argument that it was a little bit premature, if I'm not mistaken. I can't remember it all the way. I've just got this vague memory of being there, sat in the first one or two rows and thinking, hmm. But anyway... You know this this thirty four year old Ukrainian is six foot six and a half. Um, it it could go some rounds. I'm not entirely sure that Fisher's going to go in there and just steamroll him. I'm not so sure. And Fisher as well. It seems like he hasn't boxed for a while. Yeah, it's been six months, so that's probably the longest layoff he's had. So yeah, it could be interesting. Uh, also on the card, we're going to see two undefeated guys again: Austin Amo Williams, fifteen and zero for the IBF North American middleweight title over ten rounds against Armel Yasser, who's ten and zero. Uh, haven't heard of Yasser. Um, Congo, based in Germany. Um, don't really recognise any of the names on his resume there, so it's slightly padded. I'd say Austin Williams. Maybe for the stoppage. And then, yeah, the main event, Conor Ben, the return of Conor Ben, 22 and 0. He's, well, I say the return, he only boxed, what was it, uh, in September of last year. So it's only been five months. He steps in with the undefeated 16 and 0, Peter Dobson. It's over 12 rounds. Um, yeah, I mean, Peter Dobson, I'm going to hold my hands up and say that I had never heard of him until this fight got made. And even when I've looked into his record, you know, there's there's just nothing impressive there in the 16 fights that he's had. Nothing impressive at all. Um, yeah, look, I mean, obviously there's question marks with Conor, Be- Conor Ben, you know, with, with the whole foul test scandal and stuff. And he came back, and we've only seen one fight of his since. And... He went the distance, you know, but again, he did fight a tough Mexican who'd never been stopped. And I don't know if we're reading into that too much because there were people saying, oh, look, look, now he's not failing tests. He's not knocking people out after, you know, he was on a bit of a run. Well, that guy was just a tough guy. I don't know what to make of it. Some people were still not impressed with his performance, though, but he's back here against this guy. I'm expecting him to stop this guy. Like I say, the guy has really beaten no one. And I'm expecting Ben to stop him probably in the first half of the fight. So I don't have much more to add. It's going to be good to see Ben back, providing that, you know, well, I just want us to get to the bottom of this situation, to be honest with you. But all of that aside, he is a fun fighter to watch. Um, There's a decent undercard there on the zone. And there's a really good undercard, pretty much every fight I want to watch on um, the Sky card, which unfortunately I would have liked to have been there for, but they rejected my application. So uh, yeah, 
boxer have never let me into an event for some reason. But anyways, all the best to all the Brits involved in all these fights here. Um, wasn't really anything to come to you about, Eddie, this week. Um, apart from you reminding us about your birthday, which is always nice. I wouldn't have forgot. <laughs> um, but yeah, that is it. Um, that is it, that is it. So yeah, in part one we did the review part, then we welcomed our special guest, Zach Parker. In part two we did the news, we just wrapped up the preview part. It's now time for me to come in with the outro, which I'll do in just a few seconds. Okay, and this wraps up episode 433 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A huge shout-out to this week's special guest, the hard-hitting super middleweight contender, Mr. Zach Parker. The biggest thanks of all, though, goes out to you, the listeners. Thanks once again for tuning in. That is about everything from myself, though. Enjoy your weekends, people. Stay safe, and we shall see you all again same time next week.